then our Q&A, and our coming events and poll. So just a brief reminder, the introduction and speaker presentation will be recorded. So please um, keep your um, microphones muted in the meantime. So a br uh, brief, brief introduction about the American Chemical Society or ACS. It's the world's largest scientific community. And members have access to career development and networking, member groups and communities, conferences and events and funding and awards. So for career development, there are virtual office hours and you represent uh, the next ones coming up. Also, we have career consulting and career pathways workshops. In addition, you can uh, participate in ACS national meetings like the ACS fall meeting and ACS regional meetings like the Southeastern Regional Meeting, which is coming up in October and will be in San Juan, Puerto Rico. Also, we have inclusive groups and committees for all, like Women's Chemist Committee, Senior Chemist Committee, Committee on Minority Affairs, Chem Clubs, and ourselves, the Younger Chemist Committee. So for the Younger Chemist Committee, our vision is that younger chemists transform the world through chemistry. And our mission is to advocate, develop and support rising chemists to positively impact their careers through the, AC, uh, the ACS and the future of chemistry. Now, uh, we are part of the Eastern US YCC partnership, which includes local sections in Northern New York, Connecticut, Eastern New York, Philly, Rochester, Puerto Rico, St. Louis, Virginia, and Indiana. And also we have international groups uh, like the Universidad Federal de Guas in Brazil. So we carry out a lot of events going from chemistry symposiums, day in the life um, activities, self-care self activities, and a lot of uh, activities that are for your benefit and we encourage you to participate. So we wanna give a shout out for the Eastern US um, partnership for the best activity or program stimulating member involvement for the Day in the Life series, which is the one that is going on today. And also outstanding local section uh, for the Younger Chemist Committee Award. So how can you get involved? You can attend YCC events at ACS national meetings. You can join or start your own local section uh, for YCC. And you can apply for YCC sponsored awards. So now I will introduce our speaker for today, which is Sierra Science Philip, which is the founder of Sure Science Consulting. He obtained a bachelor's in chemistry from the University of the Virgin Islands and a master's in forensic science from Virginia Commonwealth University. After earning his master's, he became the first civilian crime scene investigator in St. Kitts and Nevis. He has written book chapters and scientific articles and presented forensic chemistry lectures in the Caribbean, US, Canada, and Southeast Asia. Currently, he offers consulting services as a writer, editor, and keynote speaker. So without further ado, I will hand it over to Science Philip, and we will gladly hear your talk. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot for the intro, Alejandro. It's definitely my pleasure to be here. I just have to say, though, that my first name is actually an Irish name. I'm probably the only black man, or probably not the only one. <laughs> one of the few black men that has this name it's actually pronounced Kiran, like K-E-Y-R-A-N, Kiran. But in some circles, they know me as science. You know, I'm a guy <laughs> that has had the great fortune of growing up in a place where your nickname means a lot. You know, in the Caribbean where I'm from, nicknames mean everything, right? My father always tells a joke about one of his friends. They call him smokers, right? <laughs> they actually call him smokers because of... a he said something funny when he was in when he was in elementary school and it just stuck with him. And now nobody knows his name. 
it's like everybody just knows him as smokers <laughs> so just hold on just a second for me i'm gonna get my presentation up but you know very glad to be here today and i really have heard that there's been a lot of anticipation for the audience members for this talk i really hope to make all your <laughs> all your dreams come true i would say you know, I really hope to satisfy you guys with this presentation today. So let me just make sure everything is good. Okay. Okay, so should be seeing my screen now. Oh, did I stop sharing it actually? Oh, sorry about that. That was a mistake. Okay, there we go. So it's definitely my pleasure to be invited by ACS and YCC to talk a little bit about my story and tell you guys about one of the things I'm most passionate about, which is the fantastic career that I've had, you know, on an amazing career journey, really, through the sciences. And I'm so glad that I get to share it with the community. So I want to tell you guys, you know, about just another day in the life of a crime scene chemist. You know, and maybe you might have heard of a crime scene chemist before, maybe not. But I'm glad to be a fine example for everybody to take note of. So for today's talk, you know, I want to kind of take us through the energy levels, you know, start us off at ground state, doing a little introduction, and talk a little bit about my background, really. And then, you know, get some little excitement going on, give you guys some energy and tell you guys about the coolest career in STEM, the forensic sciences. And, you know, maybe we'll have to relax back down because, you know, to really tell you guys about a day in the life of a crime scene chemist means that you have to talk about the work that we do. And the work that we do isn't always that glamorous, believe it or not. So I'm going to do a little case study and then at the end I'm going to talk about something that I don't think I get to speak enough about. Certainly not while I was actually working as a crime scene investigator, but talk about how we can get to equilibrium because all, all systems, right, whether you're a synthetic chemist, whether you're an organic chemist, you know, whether you're a physical chemist, you know, we're thinking about how all systems want to tend towards equilibrium and how we could sort of shift equilibrium to do the things that we really want to do and make it fulfilling for us. You know, that's one of the great things about being a chemist. But finding work-life balance as a chemist, you know, particularly in this field, the forensic sciences and crime scene investigation, it's not always straightforward. So I want to touch a little bit on that. And before I go any further, though, I just want to tell you guys about the amazing place where I live. So I live in a place that has had an amazing history, thousands of years before there was ever a Canada and thousands of years before there was ever even a place called Toronto. People lived here. And those people were the indigenous peoples of this continent. So I want to acknowledge that the land where I live, work and play is the traditional territory of several nations of indigenous peoples. And these include the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Arnish Nabic, the Chippewa, the Hodo, uh, the Haudenosaunee, the Haudenosaunee peoples and the Wendat peoples. These peoples still live on this land to this day. And of course, the city of Toronto is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. The particular parcel of land that I live on in the city of Toronto is actually treaty land. So I want to acknowledge that one of those treaties is Treaty 13, inside with the Mississaugas of the Credit. There's also the Williams Treaties, which are signed with multiple Mississaugas and Chippewa bands. I'd like to encourage you to learn more about the history of the place that you call home. And certainly nativeland.ca is a good place to do that. There's also the Native Governance Center as well, nativegov.org. 
because these land debt malignants, they're just a small part of what we in Canada do to bring our societies closer to truth and reconciliation. And that is so important for us. And I would really like to encourage you to look into that and step into some discomfort around that because the truth is the indigenous peoples of this continent have been uncomfortable for a long time. And colonialization is still something that is very much ongoing for them and for us today. So I'd like to leave you with this quote from the Native Governance Center. The land that surrounds us is part of who we are. It reflects our histories and we have to preserve this history and we cannot let it go away, we cannot diminish it. So I encourage you to step into some discomfort, start doing some land acknowledgements and learn more about the place that you call home. Certainly you can engage with these resources that I've listed here, but I strongly encourage you to look for the resources created by the indigenous peoples local to where you are. So let's talk a little bit about me. So my background is interesting, I would say. You know, uh, from a very young age, I've always wanted to be in this career. I think what my mother said when I was four years old is the first time I told her I wanted to be a scientist. So <laughs> it's been a long time coming and that's pretty interesting. So I had a lot of, <laughs> I had a lot of, let me see, how to really put this, role models. <laughs> So I had a lot of role models growing up on TV, right? And this guy right here is one of them. So I wonder if anybody in the audience could tell me who this person right here in the top left corner of the screen is. I'll be looking in the chat to see. So if anybody, <laughs> all right, all right. I wasn't sure if this was gonna be that kind of crowd, but Crystal definitely got the answer. It is Dexter from Dexter's Lab, like one of my favorite shows growing up. I feel like so influential for me. And Nichelle also got the answer as well. Congratulations. Nichelle was actually first before Crystal. So yeah, that's Dexter. So like I said, you know, I had some cool role models growing up, you know, in terms of the sciences. I actually have one more. So I'm going to see now if anybody recognizes this individual. This one's going to be interesting. Right, anybody recognize this person? Let's see. Professor X, he actually has another name. I wonder if anybody could get that. Professor X is actually right than Kata. And the professor, yeah, Michelle, goes by that as well. I wonder if anybody knows his other name though. Doesn't seem like anybody's got that one. Professor Utonium actually goes by Professor Utonium as well. He's from the show Powerpuff Girls. He created the Powerpuff Girls with sugar and spice and everything nice and of course, chemical X, <laughs> right? So these really were the persons that inspired me. <laughs> Funny as that sounds, these were the persons that inspired me to really you know, pursue a career in science. You know, I watched a lot of TV growing up, but you know, looking at that and looking back on, on it now, it was really cool to see that science was being portrayed as something so creative and so influential, you know, as something that could really change how things are done in the world. But there were also some issues around it. You know, I realized early on that, you know, it didn't really fit in with what was going on in science. Because when I looked at, you know, my two cartoon role models, I realized that, you know, these guys always dressed a particular way. You know, they always worked indoors and they also were always alone. You know, they didn't have any collaborators really. And it seems like while everyone else was just happy for the day to be saved, you know, the scientists were really the people who were working behind the scenes, doing a lot of difficult things to try to bring about a new reality for everyone else. And nobody really cared about the work of the scientist. So it's a bit disillusioned, particularly, you know, in my preteen years, you know, about this whole idea of pursuing a career in science, because I wasn't sure if, you know, that was gonna be me. I really didn't like wearing white, <laughs> you know, and I didn't want to be always confined to one particular area to do my work. You know, and I really didn't want to be somebody who was going to be segregated and just have to work by themselves all the time. 
So I wanted more and I wasn't sure if science was going to give me that, but that really changed when another show came out. And I wonder if anybody recognizes this gentleman right here now. So this show changed science for me. <laughs> so, and I'm sure it changed science for a lot of people too. <laughs> Gil Grissom, Gil Grissom. So Clarissa got that one. And I wonder if anybody knows the area, the specific area that he is a specialist in. He's an expert in a very specific area. What if anybody could get that? Bugs. <laughs> All right, Clarissa. Bugs is correct, but not the technical words that I am looking for. The study of insects. Not only insects, actually. Entomology. There you go, Nichelle. So forensic entomology. In particular, that was Gil Grisham's specialty. Dr. Gil Grisham, this guy, for me, really opened my eyes to what science could be. You know, the cool thing about the show that he was on, CSI, was that it featured people doing science in a way that I had never seen before on TV. These people, they didn't wear uniforms, right? Like sometimes you would see them, like they would have this jacket on that said CSI, but it was really like a cool jacket. You know, it wasn't like, you know, just a white lab coat. It was like decent design, you know, kind of, you know, edgy look. So they wore real clothes. You know, they worked outside. You know, they worked in all kinds of different places, actually, not just in a lab. And it was really cool that they actually collaborated or worked with a diverse range of people you know, coming from diverse professional backgrounds, everybody from police officers. I mean, I remember one particular episode of CSI. <laughs> they actually had to consult with a lady who was running a house of prostitution. And I thought like, what? <laughs> like, that is interesting. You know, of all the things that you could do in science, you know, like, why not share it with the general public? Why not go out there and work with different people? to really try and answer a lot of the complex questions that we find in our world. So that really changed science for me. And when I saw the show CSI, and when I saw that these scientific analyses that were being done in the real world were actually something that people outside of science, they really needed. They needed it. You know, we're talking about lawyers, you know, they needed to know this. You know, how are they going to prosecute cases without the physical evidence? We're talking about judges and jurors who are looking forward to people, explaining to them what is the evidence and how, how does it relate to this case? What does it tell you? So that was really important for me. And from that, I recognized that science and scientists support society. And it's really important for us to have people doing these kinds of jobs. And when I saw that, you know, in particular, this show CSI, that cemented for me the type of scientist I wanted to be. And that is what pushed me along the path that I'm on right now. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about my journey. <laughs> my journey through science, you know, might surprise some of you. So it started out, you know, like I mentioned previously, around the age of four, I would have told my parents, you know, told my mother in particular, you know, I want to be a scientist. And it turns out that I was never good at science in, <laughs> when I was that age. So in elementary school, I was an unremarkable science student, you know, definitely not a good math student. But I did start catching on in high school. And it turns out that while I was in high school in the United Kingdom, so I was living in England at the time, I had a really good chemistry teacher, excellent chemistry teacher. Unfortunately, I can't remember her name, but she really made me fall in love with chemistry. So during high school, I was in love with chemistry and I knew that chemistry was gonna be the thing for me. So I did pretty well in high school. I was actually, actually had the opportunity to go to college in St. Kitts, which is the country where I was born. And interestingly enough, <laughs> at college in St. Kitts, I came into this chemistry course thinking, man, I am gonna be the best student ever on this island in this chemistry course. And that was just, <laughs> you know, it really did not go well for me. So I failed out of chemistry in my first year of college. And when I say failed, I mean, like I failed everything, right? I failed every homework, every in-class assignment, every lab, <laughs> like I failed everything. And it was never the case of like failing something and just getting like a complete zero. 
you know, one of the most devastating maps I remember, the most devastating grade I remember being given was like a test. It was out of 35, 35 possible points, and I got three. I mean, that was, you know, it was, it was terrible. We actually had a cumulative exam at the end of our first year. You know, by that time, I was so tired of this whole course content. You know, I didn't study. You know, a lot of my friends tried to cram on the day of the exam and, you know, they managed to pass, but I was like one of the few people that actually failed out of this course. And that made me feel even worse, you know, to be one of the few people, you know, to fail out of something that I loved. So I was talking to my father, actually, when I, at the end of this exam, when I had gotten the grades and everything, and I was telling him, you know, I'm just going to, I'm just going to forget chemistry. You know, I'm already out of college anyway. You know, I didn't do well at that. So I'm just going to pursue something else. But he told me something really important. And I want to say that I'm sure everybody here understands this very well, that when things fail, you have to go for trial number two, right? I mean, I'm sure you've been in the research lab and things haven't gone the way that you expected. And yeah, <laughs> you know that you had to try again. And that's what I did. You know, I was able to try again. And it was like, it was like magic. It was like, all of a sudden, my eyes were opened. So every single concept that I didn't do well on in that first year, when I redid this course, everything was so clear. And I went on to do my undergrad in chemistry at a really cool place. I went to another island, a university on the island of St. Thomas in the US Virgin Islands, where I did undergraduate chemistry. And there's where I really got, you know, I found out what I really liked in terms of studying chemistry. It was carbon chemistry, so organic chemistry. You know, that was actually the first class I took at university. I was able to transfer in with some credits from college. So I actually went straight into OCHEM and I went through that with a solid B average. And a lot of people struggled with that, but I loved that class. And I also did analytical chemistry right towards the end of my degree. And I realized that that's really what I liked in terms of studying chemistry. You know, I really liked that whole side dealing with big structures and big molecules and how we can really break those down and try to find out more information about how these molecules can be helpful. And doing that, you know, really tied into analytical chemistry, using all these different instrumentation techniques, you know, and a lot of brain power as well to try and figure out, you know, how we can understand and identify particular things and what they do. So after undergrad, I went on to get, well, there's my bachelor's degree right there, graduated undergrad, you know, summa cum laude honors, the highest honors from the University of the Virgin Islands. I graduated mm -hmm. from there in 2011, and I went on to grad school in the continental US. I was actually at Virginia Commonwealth University, right there in the city of Richmond. And in grad school, I had the opportunity to do research. It was just a master's degree though. So my research should have taken between three to four months. It ended up taking me 12 months. <laughs> Again, I had a lot of failures. <laughs> so it was more like trial number 16, <laughs> you know, not just trial number two. So had a lot of failures, really. And during that time, you know, doing research, I realized that there were two things in particular that I loved about science. Number one was actually doing it, was actually getting my hands on and being very practical with science. So that's a picture of me in the lab, actually during my research times, you know, not wearing all my PPE as I should be, but I mean, it's real life, trust me. <laughs> this is what goes on in some of the labs. Some of the labs, <laughs> you should really be using your PPE people, trust me. So, you know, I really like getting my hands, you know, on different things and like mixing things together and really seeing what the outcome was. I really liked doing science that way, but I also, had the opportunity to present my research at a conference. So the American Academy of Forensic Sciences is actually the largest professional organization for forensic scientists worldwide. They put on their conference in February of 2013. And I had the opportunity to present there. I did a platform talk and like that for me was the most amazing experience. That cemented that the other thing that I loved about science was actually sharing science with the community. So these two things is really what have taken me through 
my career, the doing science, getting really practical, and then sharing the answers, sharing those results with the community. So after grad school, I was looking for a job in the US, but I was not that lucky. But however, I was fortunate to be able to return home. So there's my master's degree, graduated from VCU in 2013, and I returned home soon after and was able to actually start a full-time job as a crime scene investigator, the first ever civilian person to hold such a position in the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis. So that was a really cool accomplishment and it was a pretty decent journey, but I'm still on the journey now, you know, and I've really been able to do a lot of cool things. You know, that's me one day <laughs> going to court as a, you know, as a CSI, you know, it was really cool. So I'm still on the journey and I'm not sure, you know, where it's going to take me, but it's really interesting to still be here. And of course, glad to talk to you guys about one of the coolest careers I can say exists in STEM, the forensic sciences. So forensic science, you know, people tend to think of it as just one thing, but it's actually, you know, one of the most diverse fields of study, you know, that I've ever come across. The forensic sciences is extremely broad and it's all about using science to answer legal questions. There's a lot of complex questions that can occur when you're looking at things from a legal perspective and scientists actually it turns out as some people well suited to help with that. So in particular, I want to look at this diagram right here. So there's something called the Organization of Scientific Area Committees. It's actually under NIST, the National Institutes of Standards and Technology in the US. And they're looking at developing standards for the forensic sciences. And one of the things that they've come up with is these diagrams. So every year it sort of changes and it depends on you know, how many arms of the forensic sciences they think exist. Now, currently it looks like they're looking at seven arms of the forensic sciences, okay? So in terms of being a chemist, there's actually two different branches of the forensic sciences that you could look into. Some people go into what's called toxicology you know, looking at how substances interact within living systems. You know, sometimes they do bad things. Sometimes they do the exact things that they were meant to do, right? Which can be good, can also be bad. So you look at toxicology on drug chemistry. There's also the chemistry of trace evidence or the chemistry of materials analysis, I would call it. So that's what I went to grad school to study. You know, I did a master's degree in forensic science with a concentration in forensic chemistry trace evidence. And that's looking at all sorts of different materials. I would say everything that's not biological, not digital, <laughs> and not drugs falls into the realm of trace chemistry, really. So things like fibers, hairs, paint, glass, you know, my research was actually on matchsticks and looking at how we could possibly identify the brand and functional class of a burnt matchstick. There's also, like I mentioned, many different areas. So today I'm going to talk about scene examination, which is one of the arms of the forensic sciences. You might have also heard of DNA analysis that would come under the biology arm of the forensic sciences. And like I mentioned, digital media, you know, looking at things like, you know, the data from cellular phones, cell tower pings, or, you know, trying to break through encryptions to see what people have been hiding in terms of messages that have been sent between people. Those things come under the digital or multimedia forensics. And then there's the areas of medicine, medical legal death investigation in particular, forensic pathology as well. So there's a lot of different things that fall into the forensic sciences. And the OSACs are trying their best to really organize and standardize the work that we do. I also have to mention that you may have heard of fingerprints or fingerprint examination. That of course is under the physics or pattern arm of the forensic sciences. Oh. Don't tell me that happened. Okay, sorry about that. Okay. Ah, uh, here we go. So under the scene examination arm of the forensic sciences, you have persons who are crime scene investigators, right? 
And crime scene investigators are really focused on going to different locations and trying to identify, document, and collect items of physical evidence. And we actually use science to do that. And this is really the thing that really motivated me to become a forensic scientist because crime scenes can be quite diverse. So let's see if I could actually get this to work the way that I want it. No, sorry about that. Oh man, but crime scenes can be very diverse, okay? Crime scenes can literally be anywhere that you can think of. And <laughs> I, I'm not sure, but has anybody ever been to a crime scene? Has anybody ever been to a crime scene? If you've been to a crime scene before, drop yes in the chat for me. <laughs> Megan has been to one. All right, all right. So crime scenes can be anywhere, literally anywhere. I've been to crime scenes on cruise ships. I've been to crime scenes <laughs> inside showrooms. I've been to crime scenes in really, really small houses. I've been to crime scenes you know, that's really out in the most remote area that you could think of. And that remote area is so beautiful that you would never expect that you know, anything bad would have happened there. So crime scenes can literally be anywhere. And it really is up to the ingenuity of persons who are crime scene investigators to go out to these locations and really try to find evidence that could help us get to the truth about what happened and who is responsible. But the actual work of crime scene investigators is not that glamorous. <laughs> it's probably a really dirty job when I really think of it. So I wanted to share with you guys, you know, just a normal run of the mill everyday case that I worked on while I was a crime scene investigator in St. Kitts. So when I think about crime scene chemistry, you know, I think about how, you know, chemists have really gone in a direction that, you know, I feel like loses a little bit of the magic of what chemistry is. So the ACS would say that, you know, chemistry is the study of matter and the changes it can undergo. And that is definitely true, 100%. But what really excited me about chemistry back in high school was using all of my senses to really make sense of what was happening in the world, to try to figure out what was I seeing? What was I feeling? What was I smelling, right? What was I hearing? Like all those things was really what made chemistry fun for me. And then using our knowledge of the initial first principles of how elements and how matter interacts to make inferences that could actually give us good information, you know, to make better decisions about things, you know, in terms of better decisions of how can we use this material that grows on trees that seems to be a really nice fiber maybe we could use that to make genes right so those are the things that really excited me about chemistry but you know when i think about chemistry right now i think about you know people who are using you know fourier transform ion cyclotron resonance mass spectrometers <laughs> you know you're using like this really cool instrumentation to measure mass to charge ratios so exactly you know that we could look for you know, really big protein compounds now and actually try to figure out, you know, how we can isolate these things and use them, right? And study them even more. So instrumentation, I think, is really big in chemistry right now. But the truth is, you know, you still should not forget about your senses, right? And when I think about how chemistry works in the crime scene world, it's all about using your senses and making observations. So for example, let's look at this right here. So this is a picture, right? So I would like for you guys to put in the chat, what do you see in this picture? Just tell me what you see, you know. What do you see in this picture? <laughs> okay, wine is an is a answer that's coming from Ashley. Anybody else, what do you see in this picture? Air fryer, that's really good. I didn't think you'd be able to identify an air fryer <laughs> from that angle. Ben Katha says, some alcoholic liquid. Interesting. <laughs> I appreciate, I think it's Kira Beakers. <laughs> oh, Coral, that's a very good answer. And Julian, <laughs> a 
Okay, used oil. Used oil. I think used oil <laughs> is definitely in the picture. You know, that's cool. I appreciate I appreciate the answers. <laughs> All right. So yeah, that is an air fryer. <laughs> you know, I thought that might have been a funny angle to identify the air fryer from. But yeah. So these are two glasses and they're inside of a kitchen, right? Because we can see a kettle, air fryer, stove. There's also a toaster. And these two glasses, you know, if you are a crime scene chemist, you know, you would probably think, okay, two glasses, I could make an inference, two people having drinks, right? I don't know for sure what the liquid is. It could be alcoholic. It could, could be something else, right? But I mean, two persons about to have drinks. You know, one, the one on the right, seems to have a little less liquid in it than the one on the left. I could make another inference. Maybe the person who was drinking out of the left one drank some more than the person who drank from the right one. You know, or maybe the person who was drinking the one on the right didn't actually get to drink any. You know, but something else that I could see, you know, as a crime scene chemist, you know, something else that I would do more likely would be look at these glasses from a different angle. So when we look at the glasses from this angle, right, just using your eyes, tell me, what do you see? So I'm thinking particularly about the glass on the right. Look at the glass on the right. All right, so Nichelle pretty much has it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Sabrina. I see you, Sabrina. I see you, Sabrina. <laughs> All right. So Sabrina says, you know, really good observation from Sabrina. There's a smudge that could possibly be a lip print. Okay. There is a smudge on the glass on the right. And if we look at this right here, you could see that that is certainly a lip print. All right. And this is the kind of thing that we do on crime scenes all the time. We look at things, you know, that pretty much everyday items, right? You know, based on a little bit more information than what I gave you though. But we look at things, we make observations, and then we make inferences because it turns out that by making those inferences, we could start to do some more work that I'll get into in a bit that will actually help us get to the truth of what would have happened in this kitchen. And it might not have been anything nefarious. It might have just been that you know, one person poured two drinks, second person didn't come, you know, and then they forgot about theirs <laughs> on the counter and then they left, right? But that's really what the work of a crime scene chemist is all about. But in particular, I'm going to tell you guys about pretty much a mundane case that I worked on and, you know, about you know, how the work really goes as a crime scene investigator. So... In my job, you know, I was the only civilian for a long time working with the National Police in St. Kitts and Nevis. I was also the only person who had a science background outside of high school, all right? So, I mean, me having two degrees was like a fair departure from all of the other persons who were police officers working in what was then the Forensic Services Unit. Okay, everyone else, they had probably done some science in high schools, you know, probably done really well, but you know, outside of that, you know, nothing else. So it was a really interesting dynamic. And sometimes I had to work with other, you know, other CSIs who were police officers. And sometimes I guess when it suited the people who were in authority, you know, I didn't have to. So I went through a lot of different challenges early on in the career, but by this time, July 2018, I pretty much cemented myself as a reliable CSI. So I had to work by myself and we had a lot of different shifts <laughs> that we had to work. And in particular, on this particular day, I was working what we would call the night shift, all right? Um, really and truly, there were, uh, was a shift before this that was also in the night, but we call this particular one the night shift. So it started at 10 in the night and it finished at seven o'clock the following morning. Now, when I'm working in this shift, right, you know, I usually, you know, go and check, you know, make sure everything is where it needs to be, make sure all the equipment is ready, you know, make sure the vehicle is all nice and set, good to go. You know, I do that periodically. 
And I remember, you know, I had just checked out my vehicle to make sure you know, everything was good. And I went back to my office and then I got visited by a senior, well, a supervisory police officer, not SPO. And this guy was working in the same station as me, same shift. And he told me that he had just received a report of a house breaking. So house breaking is you know, a term that we use in saying it. Um, the actual offense would be called house breaking and larceny or house breaking with intent. So it's definitely not break in, it's breaking, <laughs> you know, which really comes from the common law. You know, something that I'm sure a lot of legal luminaries would love to talk to you about. But, you know, reports of house breaking is basically somebody entered somebody else's home and possibly committed some other crimes, like stealing some items from the home. So that was around five in that, five in the morning. And, you know, I thought, you know, it's pretty good. You know, I have two more hours on my shift. Should be able to go there and just knock this one out. So I was able to arrive on scene at around 5.30. And I met somebody there who was the first responder, a police officer actually. And I was able to talk with him and get some more information. I also met the victim there and some other members of her family. So the victim, the, a lady was the owner of the home and her children were also on scene as well. So I'm gonna share with you a little bit about what goes down on the scene. So when I first got there, and I was talking with this police officer, he had already done something called crime scene management. And crime scene management is really important. It's the business of everybody who works on crime scenes, right? So whether you're a police officer or whether you're a crime scene investigator, whether you're a forensic anthropologist and somebody calls you in, like you need to make sure crime scene management has been done and is being done. It's a very continuous thing. So in particular with crime scene management, we talk about the four C's. And the first C is confirm. So I had to confirm with the police officer who was the first responder that I had the right information. And I indeed did. I was in the right place and I had been told the right thing. And then we have to clear the scene. So when I actually arrived there, the victim and her family were not inside of the house. So that was really good. You have to take those persons out of the area of interest, all right? Outside of the location so that you can have the location preserved as best you can and give you the best chance possible to find that physical evidence. After you confirm and you clear, then you want to cordon the area. And that's usually where you see crime scene tape come into play. Now it turns out crime scene tape is not the only thing you can use to cordon crime scenes. Um, cordoning is really all about establishing an area or a boundary where you can say this is the area under investigation. So even if persons come right next to that boundary, you don't really worry too much about that because you know over that is the area that you want to have preserved and ready for your investigation. Because once you establish your cordon, then that's when you should have full control of your crime scene. And that will be the four C's of crime scene management. So that had already been done and I was able to talk and get some more information from the responding officer, and then we did an initial walkthrough. So that would be where the person who is the first responder would take the person who is the crime scene investigator through the scene and point out to them particular areas of interest. So what actually happened in this scene was that there was a front door and there was a back door to this particular house. The front door was actually right next to the road, but the back door, as you could imagine, you know, was pretty much hidden from you. Now, in the backyard, actually, were a number of items that were taken from inside of the house. And those items were not left there by the owner. It turns out that that door, the back door, had been tampered with, and somebody was able to gain entry through there. We also looked inside, we realized that there were a number of rooms that had been ransacked, and also some bigger items that were missing, particularly from the living room, okay? So having gotten that initial walkthrough and having already established that, you know, the crime scene is well managed, that's when the crime scene investigator will start to do evidence gathering. Evidence gathering includes a number of things. I always tell people that, you know, crime scene investigation is about every single area in STEM 
you know, it's not just science. You know, we use a lot of different computer technology, a lot of different equipment as well under a technology aspect. We rely on a lot of principles of engineering and we have to actually do mathematics to make sure we're doing our work correct. But, you know, in terms of evidence gathering, you know, that kind of documentation through note taking, documentation through photography, you know, what the crime scene chemist is particularly interested in is doing examinations and tests, right? Doing examinations and tests. So you do a lot of observations, you know, and then you document those in notes and photography. But in order for you to really know if your inferences are on point, you have to test them, all right? And that's what the crime scene chemist does. So we're gonna be focusing on examinations and tests. You know, not really focusing on it, just to give you guys, just scratching the surface really, to give you guys an idea of how that goes. And of course, you know, once you've done your examinations and tests, then you wanna collect those items of physical evidence. So let's start out talking about examinations. So examinations, usually come in three forms, all right? You can do visual examinations, physical examinations, and then you can do chemical examinations, all right? Visual, physical, and chemical. And this works regardless of the type of scene that you have and regardless of the type of evidence that you're looking at. These are always your options. So in particular, looking at visual examinations, um, you could also call them optical examinations. Um, one of the things that I learned during my master's degree was that chemists take their eyes for granted. We take our eyes for granted so much so that chemists, you know, some chemists, I should say, you know, they don't like to use microscopes, you know, which, you know, when I think of it now, it's like, you know, why wouldn't you want to really look at all that cool chemistry, right? Why wouldn't you want to see the color changes? You know, why wouldn't you want to see the progress of reactions? But we really take that for granted. You know, and the truth is when you're a crime scene investigator, one of the best tools that you could have is light. You know, it doesn't matter if it's light from a flashlight, it doesn't matter if it's natural light, artificial light, just having light and just being able to look at things from a different perspective can be really helpful. So let's have a closer look at this right here. So one of the things that you would see people doing, particularly on shows like CSI, is like holding flashlights at oblique angles, right? And that's very helpful actually in real life. So when you have your light source and you hold it down at a low angle on a surface, what you're actually able to do is have some of the light rays get scattered off of you know, contaminants on that surface. In this particular instance, they mentioned dust, but it could be anything really on your surface. So that scattering of light can make it back to your imaging system, could be your camera or could just be your eye. And it allows you to see things that you may not have been able to see before, like the lip print on the glass, just by looking from a different angle. So that's just one example really of how you could do visual examinations. Um, the truth is visual examinations, you know, you could hold your light at a variety of different angles. You could use, you know, a light that is 400 to 700 nanometers, you know, white light, right? You could also use blue light, you could use green light, you could use ultraviolet light because those would give you the ability to look at fluorescence, right? You could have a very reactive background or a very reflective background rather, and that would give you cause to use your light in a different way. You could also have a fluorescent background, but there's a contaminant on that background that's not fluorescent. So you could use different color lights, like I mentioned, ultraviolet light to look at that and give you good contrast between that contaminant and your background as well. So there's a variety of things that we could do. And that's why I would say, don't forget to use your senses as a chemist, particularly on the crime scene. You gotta use all your senses and do not take your eyes for granted. So visual examinations work for every single evidence type. You know, they work well for looking for latent prints. They work well for looking for fibers, really small pieces of glass, small pieces of paint, you know, even other small items like buttons, you know, just being able to manipulate light and look at it, you know, look at things with your eyes is really helpful on the crime scene. The other thing that we do in terms of examinations are physical examinations. So like I mentioned, that door, the back door of that house had been tampered with. And in cases like that, 
you could actually use something called casting material to try and figure out, you know, can I get a cast, which is actually a replica of the damage that has been done to this door and sort of figure out, you know, what type of tool may have made this damage. And if later on in the investigation, we collect some tools that we believe could be used to break into houses, maybe we could actually make a comparison between this tool and that cast that we have taken. So this particular casting material that you're seeing here, over here on the left-hand side of the screen, something called isomark. So isomark is pretty cool. It's actually two different liquids that mix together and then it becomes hard after a while. It allows you to do really nice casts like this and really good detail. You get extra good detail and it could tell you about little defects that the tool might have had that are individual to that tool. So that's really good <laughs> physical examination right there. It's actually just materials that physically interact. There's no chemical reactions going on, but just a physical interaction that sort of helps us make better inferences about um, the particular things that we're looking at, things that we observe. I think one of the most popular <laughs> physical examinations is using fingerprint powder. I think a lot of people are familiar with that. And black powder is actually pretty infamous amongst crime scene investigators. I know many CSIs who do not like to use black powder, right? <laughs> but, you know, fingerprint powders, they actually make latent prints easier to see. So you might not have seen that lip print, you know, just looking at it with light, right? You might need to enhance that or develop it further. And one of the tools that you could use is a contrasting powder, a fingerprint powder. So black powder in particular is a granular powder and it actually physically interacts with the water in your sweat. And that's what you leave behind when you touch different items. Um, same thing on your lip, the natural oils that you would have on your lip that you would leave behind on the glass. You know, you have powders that could interact with that and actually make it more visible, a really cool physical examination. In terms of physical examinations, they work well on what we call pattern evidence, impressions, like tools being forced into doors. You could imagine crowbars, screwdriver, and also fingerprints on different surfaces, but like tires that run on the ground, you can look for tire impressions, you can look for Schumach impressions on smooth surfaces. You know, any type of patterned evidence, we usually use physical examinations because that works pretty well on those. In terms of chemical examinations, chemical examinations have gotten really popular because like, it's one of the things I really like about chemistry, color changes, right? <laughs> and in terms of color changes and in terms of chemistry and in terms of crime scenes, I think that there's nothing more popular than this reagent right here. So this is a compound called luminol. Luminol um, reacts with the heme protein in blood and it actually gets, can't remember if it's oxygen, it gets oxidized by heme protein and it actually changes color, all right? It changes color immediately to a nice blue, okay? And you can see it very well in a darkened room. Probably won't be able to see it well in daylight, but luminol basically glows on contact with blood and it's very sensitive, okay? It's a very popular technique to use. There's also this compound right here, you know, maybe some of the chemists in the room would recognize this one. <laughs> it's a really popular indicator. It's phenolphthalein, phenolphthalein. Say that, weird. So phenolphthalein, also a pretty good test for blood as well, right? So it reacts with the same heme group in blood and it turns pink, you know, nice little chemical examination. So these are actual chemical reactions that happen and those chemical reactions are often used in biological evidence. They actually tell us whether or not we could have a potentially good sample. It turns out that luminol and phenolphthalein, they're not confirmatory tests for the presence of blood, mm -hmm. okay? They actually react very similarly with a wide variety of substances. But those chemical examinations are actually really good information for the crime scene chemist because that means we could also take a sample of this same thing. We could send it off to a lab and possibly, you know, get a DNA profile from this particular body fluid. There's a 
so many more different things that you could do <laughs> at the crime scene, right? A lot of different chemistry. But I just wanted to scratch the surface and let you guys know that it really is all about using your senses, making observations, making inferences, and then testing those by using some really cool and sometimes really simple chemistry that we take for granted. So last thing I just want to touch on now is just the whole idea of how do we get back to equilibrium, you know? Um, this particular scene took me five hours of work, all right? Now, a little less than five hours, truth be told. <laughs> Four and a half. So my shift was supposed to end at seven. I left the scene at around 10 o'clock in the morning. And that was actually not the end of my work day. All right. So even though you know, I had looked at all these particular examinations, I collected a bunch of different things, you know, that was not the end. I had to go back to my office. And, you know, you do more work, you know, you do more things like writing up requisitions to try to get further testing done, you know, and making reports so that persons who are investigators or detectives can understand what you did and you know possibly use that in their investigations going forward and the truth is you know forensic science it may seem you know like really instantaneous on tv but the more high profile the case the more complex the case the more work it requires from you so this was just a you know a normal day you know, I normally <laughs> would have gone overtime, you know, just working any shift. It doesn't matter if it was a night shift or a day shift. You know, overtime happens frequently for crime scene investigators. And when you're talking about a truly major case, like you could literally spend the same amount of time outside of your shift hours doing your work that you spend, you know, scheduled to be on shift. So, you know, you work a nine hour shift and you could basically end up pulling a double, you know, just because, you know, this is what the work requires of you. And it has a lot of impacts on your everyday life, a lot of different things. You know, one of the things I remember was um, when I was working, my first son was born and they actually didn't have paternity leave, you know, set up in our agency. So I took vacation, but I was basically made to feel guilty. <laughs> that I was going to go on, I think it was just two weeks vacation, you know, to basically help out, you know, my wife, you know, raising a newborn son. You know, and it was, you know, those kind of things can really, you know, they really drag on you, you know, a lot of different things, you know, seeing some traumatic stuff. And then, you know, the whole idea that all this work that you do, you know, it doesn't always give you an answer that you're looking for, right? You know, forensic science is definitely not a magic bullet. It doesn't solve everything. And there are occasions that, you know, no matter how much work we do, we just don't find the evidence that would give us a clear answer to help us find the truth. So, you know, it's still an ongoing thing for me. I'm not really sure, you know, how we're going to resolve these issues in the field. You know, I really hope that there's more attention being paid to it, you know. I've, now not been working as a CSI for three years and things have changed a little bit for me. I still don't sleep very well. <laughs> you know, I've been, there's many times that I've been asleep and I've been called to crime scenes as well. So, <laughs> you know, sleep has really been impacted for me. So these are things that I would like, you know, for you guys to really consider, you know, when you think about the work of the crime scene chemist. So thanks a lot for listening to me. You know, I hope it was not a bad presentation. I would just like to remind you guys that I am Kieran Science Philip. And I run a small consulting company called Shore Science Consulting. So definitely check me out. You can find me on Instagram at RAS underscore science, R-A-S underscore S-C-I-E-N-C-E. -E. You can also find me on Facebook and LinkedIn. Just search for Kieran Philip on both of those platforms. You can also follow my company, Shore Science Consulting. So thanks a lot for listening to me.